I don't know if any of you remember this movie uh, somewhere. I, I watched it on video many years ago called Chocolat. Anybody remember this movie? And I'm not the only one who has uh, put little sermon messages to do with it. It just has all kinds of spiritual meaning in it. But anyway, this beautiful young lady, a single mom, moves into a little small town. I think it's in France or somewhere. And uh, she opens up a chocolate store. And uh, how do you get people to come to your store? You begin to give away samples. So she would stand at the door, and, and people were reluctant and scared. <laughs> But gradually they would try a cup of hot chocolate and, and they'd be hooked or a little piece of chocolate. And one by one, she began to get people in. Except that the priest and the mayor were fighting against her. It was Lent. And you're not supposed to have any sweet. You're not supposed to have any of these things. And so there was this debate in the city over whether you could eat this chocolate. Anyway, you can watch the movie. There's a scene in the trailer that I looked at last night where a young boy, she says, here, you want a piece? And he takes a piece, and then the mother says, no, 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 it's Lent. Put it back. And that becomes the context of the whole movie, and it is a paradigm of what we struggle with in the church. Is the church more like the chocolate store drawing people because it just tastes so good? And because it makes you feel good and alive and it's wonderful. Or are we mostly lent? People taking away. Okay. We just, I've been thinking a lot about it this week. I'll tell you stories from this week. Have a young couple coming to see me. And uh, doing premarital counseling, and I said, let's just talk about God. She's Adventist, he's not, neither have gone to church for years. We sat together this week at Thai restaurant, and I said, tell me what happened. And as usual, there's a story, not so much always about God, but about church. She went on a summer, one of these summer programs that are fantastic in many ways, selling books in the summer. We've had them right here, sleep on our floor. But somewhere the leaders that were there were very conservative, very strict, and very controlling. And she just walked away. And I said, why extrapolate from those three people to the whole church? Well, that's what people do. I went to another dinner Thursday night. People are fairly well-to-do, beautiful home down by the ocean. I did their wedding, did that, dedicated the kids, haven't been in church for years trying to work their way to coming back. Listen to the story. Many stories. I'm scared to tell you all of them. I'll just tell you one. You won't tell you the school. She came from an outside country, country outside of America, went to an Adventist school. She could not uh, keep up with the language, trying to follow her dictionary, trying to keep up. Came to the final test for a class. She went to the teacher and said, could I just have 10 minutes? I just come to the country. I'm struggling with the language. I know the material. Would you give me 10 extra minutes? And the teacher said to her, if you didn't know the language, you should go back to your own country. And you accumulate 10 or 15 of those stories. And pretty soon, I said, but I can give you just as many wonderful stories of people. Yeah, we know, Pastor. I saw a young lady who graduated with my son last year, last Sunday. I had her in my class last year. Beautiful, smart, passionate. One of the most well-read 21-year-old girls I've ever met. Went back to Germany, came back to graduate. I walked across the room. Here she was. And I went up to her and I emailed also last night. And I said, you're one of the brightest, most passionate people. But when I went around the circle of my class and I said, what's your religious background? She said, former Adventist. 21 years old, something, somewhere. And I said to her Sunday afternoon, I offered again last night, would you give me 20 minutes at Starbucks and just see if I can give you a different picture of God than whatever it is. I said, we cannot afford to lose people like you. And I said to her, if all the people like you and like us who have a passion, who have a great picture of God, if we all leave, then the church for sure becomes them. They, whoever they are. And I said, we have as much a right to define the church as they do. But if we leave, for sure the church comes that way. 
or enough of us who feel this way could get together and make a church out of the character of God and out of grace and maybe we could make the church the way we want it to be. Which is it? And which side is going to win? Some of you heard about the person who wrote an article against my side of the church and our picture of God and the things that we stand for. But what if they're right? They feel like that is the direction the church should go. What if it turns out we're wrong and our picture of God is just wrong? Which side is really going to win? Which picture of the church is it finally going to be before it's all done? And then we come to this passage, Acts chapter 5. If you have a Bible or take one from the pew, or you can follow along on the screen. But it's a full story here, Acts chapter 5, one of the famous stories, Ananias and Sapphira. It looks like this terrible, awful story. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for this land? It was their money. You can do whatever you want with your money. But now, he says, you have lied to God. In Acts 5, verse 5, it says, When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Five minutes later, his wife comes in. Is this all the money? Yes, it's all the money. And she dies. Is this any way to start a new church? <laughs> God starts killing people who don't give quite enough offering. We have another offering coming. You have a chance today still. <laughs> that would help church budgets. If one or two would die every once in a while, <laughs> the word would go out. But there are other people who think this is the way that people have been getting away with sinning for too long and it is time at the end of the world for someone to take a stand to call sin by its right name and to begin to, uh, to have a few people die would not be a bad idea. If you bring the wrong food to the potluck or if you wear too much jewelry or if you're still watching a little bit of the World Cup game when the sundown goes down on Friday night. And then maybe this would be the way. And finally, we will get rid of all the Achans in the camp and we will purify the church. And then we will be ready for the louder rain to pour out and Jesus can finally come. They think we should have more Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Well, how are you going to work this out? How did this get into the Bible? Last year as I drove by, my old church has a sign that says they're dealing with all the texts in the new Bible that you want to ask. How in the world did that get into the Bible? Maybe this is one of them. One of the more difficult passages in the Bible. How did it get here? It seems pretty clear when people look at this story that their side is right. That if you mess up, if you color outside the lines and you go against God's rules, God will eventually have to kill you in order to have heaven the way he'd like it to be. It doesn't matter whether he kills you slow or kills you fast. Either way, God is killing you. He tells us to love our enemies, then why doesn't he have to do it? How come he can kill the people who disagree with him? Well, I've had to work this out over the years the best I can. We can't do what Thomas Jefferson and others have done, try to X out all the parts of the Bible that don't seem to fit. The Holy Spirit put it in. And we're going to have to somehow merge these two different pictures of God. God is not dysfunctional. God is not schizophrenic. He is not bifurcated. He is not conflicted or confused. God is one. So we have to find a way to deal with this passage and put it into the package. So I look down at the next passage, which is a story of the miracles. And it says, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together, Solomon's colonnade. And it says in verse 15, they brought all the sick into the street, and at least Peter's shadow would fall on them. And it says in verse 16, all of them were healed. All of them. But isn't it clear? We have all these chaplains are here. Isn't it clear that God is not healing everyone today? 
And you may think maybe if we had more faith, we wouldn't. Or if somehow we were more holy. Or maybe some would say, now we have hospitals. Then they didn't have hospitals. Maybe we don't need to have all the miracles anymore. But I think most people who look at it would say, isn't it clear that we don't have the miracles all the time, all the way through history? They have been clustered around certain key events. What I call crossroad, pivotal, defining moments in earth's history. When God is trying to do something spectacular, have a revival, and he does something special. The miracles didn't happen every day. They were clustered around certain times. People usually talk about the Exodus, all the miracles in the Red Sea and the, the Jericho's walls come tumbling down. Then the time of Elijah and Elisha and the fire coming down out of heaven and axe heads floating to the top. And then Jesus and then the Acts of the Apostles. These four times. You watch ESPN. You watch a soccer game, World Cup for an hour and a half, and maybe after an hour and a half, there's one goal, and they win one nothing. They were game 0-0 this week. But when you watch the highlights on ESPN or Sports Central, they only show the goals. It looks like it's just one second after the other, and these are all the highlights. The Bible are the highlights. And you think these are happening all the time. No, they were not. Sometimes 100 years between these stories. They happened at certain defining times when God would come into our world. And my way of understanding it is this, that God uses short-term, unnatural methods. He steps in in order to teach us about the long-term, natural consequences of choosing to live God's way. God uh, multiplies the, 5, 000, the bread for the 5,000. Not so that you can think, if I could just pray hard enough, I would never have to plant any more food, never have to go to the grocery store. God would just provide. That is not what the point is. But God wants you to learn that if you will follow his ways, he will feed you and he will satisfy you. But you will have to plant the, the seed. And you will have to do some things. He does not have us just come here to pray and if we just pray hard enough, we don't have to fly to the Philippine churches. We'll just pop up in the hospitals and all the clinics and schools. We'll just come to be without us going over there to dig and do cement and do all the work and raise any money. No, God wants us to go and be part of the mission trip. And so God tries to teach us this. And chocolate, she uses what she makes and she pays for hoping by giving people samples and tastes of their hot chocolate and her chocolate that people will gradually switch over and they will begin to buy in themselves and they will begin to buy and become lovers of chocolate on their own. And she won't be the one having to provide it all the time anymore. And God is hoping that will be that way with us. We have a son flying out tomorrow to go interview at another job. And you hope as parents that somehow while we had control, you could teach certain things. And then you hope that when they leave your house, it, it jumped, it passed. And they begin to buy in and becomes part of what he will say to that person tomorrow. And say, this is who I am. This is what I believe and what I stand for and what I will do if you want me to work at your place. You hope it jumps. I spent a long time trying to think of an uh, illustration for this. It is difficult to illustrate in real worlds. And all of a sudden, it hit me. It's movies. It is what the movies do in our world today. <laughs> Not the average run-of-the-mill, just Saturday night, car-chasing, whatever movies. Those ones that are classic, that are Academy Award-winning movies made by the Spielbergs and the great movie producers of all time. Those people, yes, are telling a story and want to give you great pictures, but every one of them is trying to tell you a message. They are philosophers and theologians, and they are making a point to have an agenda. They want to change the world in two hours or 90 minutes, and they want you to, make, to get the point. And they take a lifetime that you would take a whole lifetime to learn, maybe 70, 80 years. You finally learn some things, and they want you to get it in an hour and a half. You walk into the movie, and you say, I got it. And that's what God does with a miracle. 
He doesn't want to wait for you to have 80 years to finally learn by experimentation how things really are. He telescopes all that down. And in a miracle, he says, that's what I can do for you if you'll follow my instructions to the letter. And I can make your life rich and make your life more abundantly. So I could give you 100 movies for this. I only have time, but I'll give you one. Pretty Woman. One of uh, movies that most people know. And you know the story. Julia Roberts is a prostitute on the street. Richard Gere comes and takes her off the street, takes her to the penthouse. And he takes her to Rodeo Drive and he dresses her with gorgeous clothes. And gradually, as she begins to be treated differently, it begins to go into the inside. There's all kinds of lessons in this movie. But the real lesson, if you think about it hard, is at the end of the movie when uh, he goes in the car in the limo to catch up to her. And uh, he climbs the fire escape up to her. And finally with the rose, he's there with her. And he says, after the prince comes and rescues you, what does the princess do next? And she says, she rescues him right back. Did you understand? Because he was a prostitute too. She's the prostitute in the movie. But the point they are trying to make is he was running businesses and he was splitting up businesses and ripping businesses apart and he was doing everything for business and for money apart from heart. And while he rescues her, she is also rescuing him. They're trying to make a point. And this movie tries to take lessons from life and put it down into an hour and a half to make a point. That's what God does with movies. Are you okay, Bob? What's happening? Okay. But here's the problem. God can't use movies. There were no movies back then. God has to live in the real world. He has to deal with where we are in the dirty, messy world. And he hoped that somehow you will make the jump that when he does a miracle, he hopes you will transition to realize these are the blessings if you follow his way. And if you do it the way that he asks you to do it. And now let me make the jump. The flip side is also true. When you come to the things that are hard in the Bible, God does not do them all the time. They are very, very rare. They are these few pivotal crossroads, defining moments. When God is trying to do something big, trying to start the church, trying to start the exodus, when Jesus is coming to start the new kingdom, and God wants to do something that is crystal clear, and he doesn't know what else to do but to step into our world. And he does something that is not who he really wants to be. With tears streaming down his face. And God uses short-term, unnatural methods from himself to teach us about the long-term, natural consequences of choosing to live apart from God. And so when Uzzah reaches up to touch an ark, and God immediately strikes him dead, God is using a short-term to teach you about long-term is that if you do not respect holy things, eventually it will kill you. And so when God says you have a marriage that God pronounces holy, and if you don't respect it, eventually that will kill you. The Sabbath is holy. Respect it. Nature, God has made nature holy. It's his nature, his creation. Respect it. Treat it carefully, or eventually you'll run out of water, you'll run out of land, you'll run out of rivers, you'll run out of trees, and it will gradually kill you. And God takes years and years of reality, and he telescopes it down into a moment. And Lot's wife. And God says, don't look back. Don't ever look back. Don't you ever think that somehow where you came from is better than where I am taking you. And God uses one person's experience hoping he can explain and save millions of people who hear the story. See? And now God comes to this story of Ananias and Sapphira 
Two people who promised that they would bring all the money from their sale. God is trying to get a new church started. And he has certain things that he's trying to accomplish with this church. He said, maybe I better do this now. I cannot wait for 70 years. We won't have a church left if I don't nip this in the bud right here and right now. And so they had promised God the money. Now that was God's money. When you hold back, now they're stealing from God. And he says, we better, we better make that clear. Number two, when you give your word, that word better be serious. That word matters. Keep your word. Number three, if you think you have to hold something back, I better take care of myself. I'm not sure God will really take care of me. I better hold some of this back. You are not trusting God. But number four, if you begin to be the kind of person who has to take care of themselves, you begin to be one, I don't want to give, I don't want to sacrifice, I want to hoard to myself, I will take care of myself, I will plan for my own retirement, I will take care of myself. You will, you will gradually have something happen to your heart and your heart becomes small and your heart becomes hard and your heart becomes close. And eventually your spiritual heart just stops. And Jesus says, I don't want to wait for 70, 80 years for you to learn this yourself. I will let these two people pass, first death, so that maybe you will all learn this is what will happen to you if you hold on to taking care of yourself. And here's the controversial part. Not everyone agrees with this. This is not the second death. This is first death. This is sleep. All these people will rise again. All these people that had these difficult experiences. Uzzah, Lot's wife, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the Amalekites, where God did something. Just, boy, those are all first death. God just lets them sleep for a while. Eventually, they will rise again. And one person wrote in the Adventist Review this week, is that when those people awake, and there is the city of the New Jerusalem, there will be 12 gates. And those gates are open wide because Jesus says, Revelation 3, verse 8, Behold, I have set before you an open door which no man can shut. Amen? God is a God of open doors. Well, now, watch this. Just for a little fun with you before we're done. It always blows my mind that I can just choose the next chapter in the Bible without knowing what is in the chapter. I'm going to preach April 5, Acts 5 next week. And you get into the chapter, and there's always something about the character of God in this passage. It's always here. I hope that you'll enjoy this. If you're looking there after this story, they end up in jail. The people don't like it, they end up in jail. <laughs> the angel comes to them in jail and says, here, I'm going to let you up. Go back into the temple and preach the full message of God. And they go into the jail and they can't find them. Someone comes, your people you had in jail are now preaching in the temple. And here they are preaching in the temple and they say, you killed Jesus and you put him, but he is God. They get mad, they want to kill him. And Gamaliel stands up and he says, be careful. Be careful if this is not of God. It'll go away on its own. You don't have to kill it. But if this is from God, you better be careful about fighting it because you might be fighting God. Think about that when you want to say something about someone else. When someone does something in a way that you have a hard time with, be careful. Be careful. It might be from God. And now it says they came out of jail. It says they rejoiced. In verse 41, that they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Worthy of disgrace. That they got to be the ones to carry the truth about God to this town, to this time. That God was entrusting his message. We get to be the ones to go over to the Philippines. Not all of you get to go. We get to go. Someone gave us money. Someone donated, sacrificed, so that these 16 get to preach. These people get to do vacation Bible school. We get to be the ones. There will be nights when they will come back to the hotel and they will say, this is really hard, Pastor Dan. You get up and preach 200 people and the first 125 are all little kids moving and running around the whole time. It's difficult and it's hot. And how to preach in another language to another culture to another place is difficult. But it's an honor that God has given to us and to our church. Amen? 
Many years I've used the story of Muhammad Ali. I've been reading a book about him. Muhammad Ali, after all that he had done in the 1994 Olympics, when the athletes who were on the athletic team for the Olympics in Atlanta had a choice, who would be the one to carry the flame to the top and light the flame after it had been carried all over the world? Muhammad Ali won the election. With Parkinson's disease, he carried that flame up to all those steps in a white suit. Some of you saw it. And then he lit the flame and he stood there. I read a story later that when he was back in the motel with his wife and all their family and friends, he sat there for hours holding the unlit torch, just could hardly speak with the honor that had been given to him to be the one in front of two billion people around the world to represent the U.S. and our Olympic team in the last 50 years of athletes. He was chosen to be the one, the honor. And these people are proud that they get to be the ones. They're just beaten and flogged by these people. They're proud of the honor. They get to be the one to speak about God. And now look what it says. Verse 42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They never stopped speaking about the good news. These people did not give up on the church because of these hypocrites. Many people, ah, oh, I can't go to the church, filled with hypocrites. They didn't leave the church. They didn't leave the church because some people were being healed and some were people were being not. These people had decided that God was good and that God was only good news now and forever and nothing was going to drive them away from God and from the church. They never stopped giving people the good news about God. Can I say as clearly as I can, the good news is not about the church. Is that what it says? The good news is not about the church. I hope it is good news, but that is not the good news. The good news is not about people. The good news is about God. Do not let people take you away from the good news about God. We're on the way. We are human people. Do not extrapolate from two or three people who, are, who have a distorted, dysfunctional, toxic picture of God. Do not let them take you away from God and the good news of the church. These people say, we will stay with God and we will teach the good news no matter what we see happening in the church. Settle that. And if I can go one more step. If it says that they never stop giving the good news about God, I think that means that God is always good news. There are not some parts of God that are good news and a few parts that, oh, maybe I'm not so sure. We don't have to have where God is some good news and some bad news and hope there's more good news than bad and give God a C plus that he somehow passes the test. They never stop giving the good news because God is always good news. From beginning to end, he is always good news. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is always good news. He is never anything less than good news. Amen? And if you have a story you have a hard time with, it's because we don't understand it yet. But when you understand it, we will all say, God is good news. That's what this means. Can I go one more step with you? I think Acts 5 is a picture of the shaking at the end of the world. When someday there will be a group like this. The hypocrites will all be gone. Right? Another passage? The hypocrites are gone. The people who said, we'll give you this, and they didn't give it. Those will all be gone. All the judges, all the religious leaders who were judging other people, no, you're wrong. You cannot preach that. You don't fit our picture, picture of God. Those people will all be gone. All that will be left will be the people who have good news about God. And so as I wonder which group is going to win out in the direction of our church, those who want to push a religion of rules and a harsh picture of God and a God of vengeance and a God who destroys people at the end of the world, or will it be the group that wants to preach a gracious picture of God, that God is good news and kind? This passage gives me hope that it's the good news people are going to win. It is the good news side of the church that is going to win. Everyone else is going to be gone. The only people are those people at the end who are never stopping preaching and teaching the good news about God. It's going to win before it's all done. Please don't misunderstand a simple little story. It's an Ann Landers, all right? If you get mad, it's Ann Landers, not me. A man wrote a letter about his parents and their 50th wedding anniversary to Ann Landers. 
And in this story, he said, I want you to tell you about my parents. They just got their 50th wedding anniversary this week. They're on their way to Hawaii. When they got married 50 years ago, they only had a few dollars. They could only go on a three-day honeymoon 50 miles away from their home. School teacher, I forget their jobs, very average, middle-class people. But they had a dream. They said, someday on our 50th wedding anniversary, we're going to go on a trip to Hawaii. And the way they saved money, they went and got a little metal box. And every time they made love, they put a dollar in the box. He would come home from work and he would say, honey, I got a dollar in my pocket. And she would say, I know how to spend it. A little dollar. And this son, one of five kids, he said, my parents went on their 50th anniversary and we put them on the plane yesterday with the money from that metal box. Is that good? And he said, my father whispered to me on the way to the plane. He said, we're going to go to Cancun next. That may only take 25 years now. <laughs> but here's my point. Every one of those five kids, when they got married, the parents gave them a metal box. And they told them the secret. And every one of those five couples was now on the same plan with their metal box. That's how the faith is supposed to pass on when someone does something that is so good and so alive and so wonderful that it gets passed on. And people say, I get it. That's good. It's chocolate. You win people not by a picture of God that has vengeance and lent and taking away. We will win people to God by chocolate. Taste it and know that God is good. When I got here my second week, 100 people were here. I bought C's candy for every single person in the church. I cannot afford to buy you all C's candy anymore. But I hope you'll remember, chuck a lot. That's how we want to win people to God. Amen? I'll just say this before I'm done. If you came to church today and your picture of God is maybe God is the kind of God who burns and tortures people in a fire and hell every day forever. God is better than that. If your picture of God is a God of rules and God is up in heaven with all these rules and angels that he assigns to watch over you and to try to catch you doing something wrong so he can keep you out of heaven, God is better than that. If your picture is a little better and you think God is sort of a grandfather with long white hair and he's kind of kind and kind of going to be okay. He's better than that. And if you have the best picture of God this world has ever seen, and you have God better than all your friends and relatives and all of that, and God is magnificent, he's even better than that. God is better than your wildest dreams of who God is. God is good news from beginning to end. And he is worth whatever time you put into him down here. He is worth it. Amen? God bless you all.